One of the greatest obstacles to crafting health and wellness is identifying and controlling inflammation. It's at the core of all complex and chronic diseases, and it's the driving mechanism that underlies the most common symptoms that people like you struggle to overcome. Join us as we explore cutting-edge science and research to give you the information and tools you need to create the quality of life you want and deserve. And now, here is the host of Inflammation Nation, Dr. Stephen Nosworthy. So we're talking about difficult weight loss and the role inflammation plays in that. And I guess we would define difficult weight loss as a situation where someone is doing what conventional systems suggest should work, uh, and it's not. And that would be just simply eating less and moving or exercising more. And uh, what I want to do is just continue on from where we left off in the last discussion. And I was talking about uh, making sure that you're looking at the fundamentals. Um, it's very difficult to hit a target if you can't see the target. Or to say it another way, things that you measure and observe tend to improve. And so we talked about knowing what your total calorie goals are and setting that first and understanding what uh, beneficial macronutrient profile is when you're discussing or thinking about losing weight and causing a change in your body composition. And just to define that, because I've used that term a couple of times, body recomposition or body recomp as it's talked about in the industry, basically means losing fat and gaining muscle, which in pretty much every way conceivable and measurable is, is a good and an advantageous thing. And while I'm on that topic, let me deal with a misconception that I think is certainly less of a misconception now than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago, and this applies mostly to women, is that uh, there, there has been kind of an old school thought that women shouldn't or don't want to add muscle because it makes them look bulky. And if you hadn't heard this yet, number one, um, it's a far more difficult for women to add a lot of muscle mass compared to men just simply because of hormonal profiles. But moreover than that, and probably more importantly, is that when you, when you look at a pound for pound comparison of fat versus muscle, muscle is much denser and takes up less space than body fat does. And so if you lose five pounds of body fat and you gain five pounds of muscle, your total weight does not change because you dropped five away and you added five of something else, but you will physically be smaller. You'll feel stronger, you'll look leaner, and you'll actually be smaller even though the scale didn't change. And even though weighing yourself and keeping track of that, I think at least on a weekly basis, is beneficial in most cases, unless you're obsessing over it, and then that can be a little bit of a difficult thing. Um, ideally, what we want to do is have these loose targets and, and monitor them on some periodic interval that makes sense. And so the first target is, let's make sure that we understand how many calories we're eating. And so it's very easy just to get out on the internet and Google or search something like, how many calories do I need to eat? And you'll come up with any number of calculators that will give you a number. And, and as I mentioned in the last discussion, these are calorie estimates. Don't obsess if, if the calculator says you need to get 1,712 calories and you only manage to eat 1,704, don't worry. Number one, because there's a margin of error and you're probably not eating 1,704 calories. You could be eating 1,650 or 1,740. So there's a, 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 some wiggle room in there. It's, it's about having a reasonable goal that you shoot to hit on a fairly consistent basis. So let's put that aside for the moment. And I wanna talk about um, macronutrient profiles and how to set yourself up for success when it comes to weight loss and body recomposition. So in terms of having some kind of a strategic model or an approach, number one is let's know what your calorie goals are. And again, you can use a calorie calculator or you could simply just go, I'm gonna take my body weight and multiply by that, that by a factor that's going to estimate my caloric needs. And that factor can be anywhere from say 10 to 12 calories per pound. So I guess we're gonna talk a little bit more about this before we move, move on to the macros. Um, so let me say it this way. Let's say that someone weighs 200 pounds and I'm, I'm gonna use that for simple math and they want to lose weight, well, they should eat probably somewhere in between 2,000 and 2,400 calories per day. So that would be 200 times 10 on the low end or 200 times 12 on the high end. 
And that's kind of an easy way to approximate. And usually what we'll do, if we don't want to go through the rigmarole of doing these calculations and getting a, a more precise number as an estimate, even though it's an estimate, we call it a precise number because we're shooting for a target. Um, you can just simply say, okay, I'm going to start by taking my body weight in pounds and multiply by that 12. And I'm going to do that for two weeks and see how much weight I lose. And if I don't lose a pound and a half to two pounds per week, then I'm going to go take my body weight and multiply by 11. And I'll do that for two weeks and see how much weight I lose. And you go anywhere between 10 and 12 calories per pound, and that's usually sufficient. In some cases, we might go just a little bit lower than that, but we'd have to have a compelling reason to do that. So once we have our total daily caloric goal set, the next thing we do is let's take a look at the macros. And we can't just kind of guess. We don't want to roll the dice. We don't want to just pick up a, you know, a random book and see what somebody says. What we want to do is kind of follow the science. And the first thing that we have to do in setting our macros is setting our protein targets. And if part of body recomposition is to at least maintain, and if, if not, even better, to add some muscle mass. Remember, pound for pound, muscle takes up less space than fat. So even if you trade off muscle and fat weight, you're still going to be smaller, leaner, and stronger, which is, uh, who's going to argue with that? So what the science says in terms of protein intake is that there is a spectrum. How much protein intake you need really depends on what your goals are. And if you're in the gym and you're lifting weights, you're doing resistance training, or if you're involved in heavy physical labor, and I'm not talking about working in an office where you, you know, periodically lift a binder or a fax machine or something like that. Even if you're on your feet all this all the time, that's not considered heavy labor. I'm talking working construction or, um, you know, lifting and slogging and digging ditches, like things that are physically exhausting and taxing. Then ultimately, what the research says in terms of protein intake, when you're trying to recomposition your body, is that your protein intake needs to be somewhere around, and again, it's a range, somewhere around 0.7 to even as high as 1.2 grams of protein per pound of body weight. Now that might sound like a lot, and, and I can guarantee that the average North American is not consuming that much protein. So let me give you an example. Again, let's say you know someone weighs 200 pounds and they want to recomposite their body and they want to lose body fat, add some muscle, at 200 pounds, they would need to eat at least 140 grams of protein per day. That's 200 times 0.7. That would be on the low end. What the studies say is that as your physical activity increases, as your muscle strength and muscle mass increases, you can benefit from, from more. So for example, somebody might get better results if they're eating 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight. That would be 200 times 0.8 or 160 grams. It's just simple math. You can use a calculator on your smartphone to figure this out. Just take your body weight, multiply it by 0.7, and that's the total amount of protein, the least, the minimum amount of protein you should be eating on a daily basis. But what the studies continue to show is that increasing levels of protein, in, protein intake can actually accelerate your weight loss. And if you think of it this way, if you have a fixed number, again, it's a general target, but you have a fixed number of calories that you're trying to consume every day, the more calories you take in by eating more protein, the fewer calories you have that can come from fat and carbohydrates. So what we're trying to do is optimize something called muscle protein synthesis. And in doing so by resistance training, lifting weights, increasing our general physical activity, we limit the pool that we can draw from for energy between fats and carbohydrates, and we can manipulate those two things to optimize our physiology to make sure that we indeed do hit our goals and hit our targets. Now, sometimes it's not as quick as we want, and sometimes progress comes in fits and starts where you might lose consistently for a while and then you hit a plateau. There's almost always a reason for that. Sometimes you just need to reconfigure your calories or your macros. Sometimes you're hitting a metabolic obstacle, i.e. something that's inflammatory that's preventing the weight loss. And you have to go fix something else before the process can kick in again. So if we are doing this in an orderly progression, the first thing we're doing is we're setting our total calories, set your total calories somewhere between 10 and 12 calories per pound of body weight. The next thing we do is set our protein. 
and we set that between 0.7 and 1.2 grams per pound of body weight. Now, let me go back because I realized that I, that I didn't fill in this piece. I was saying that research increasingly concludes that increasing your protein intake does enhance muscle protein synthesis and people tend to lose more fat and gain more muscle eating more protein up to a reasonable point. And so we might even say like, as a, just as a benchmark across the board, if you're trying to lose weight and add muscle, lose body fat, I should say, and add muscle, you should probably consider eating one pound of protein per pound of body weight. So a 200 pound person would eat 200 grams. And again, now that's a fair amount. If you look at say an average chicken breast, you're looking at maybe 25 or 30 grams of protein. Um, a three or let's say a three ounce steak has got probably about 30 grams of protein. And so that's a fair amount of protein. And a lot of people are not used to eating that. And sometimes what we'll see depending on how fatty the cut of meat is, is that sometimes when people increase their protein intake, they run into uh, issues with maldigestion where they feel like uh, protein is just kind of sitting in their stomach and it's not processing. That is a classic or a hallmark symptom of hypochlorhydria or low stomach acid where they're just not, they don't have enough stomach acid to break down the protein and so it, it goes unprocessed. And then that protein can actually putrefy in the gut in, uh, promote um, acid reflux and, and kind of dyspepsia or just this uh, protein-based stomach discomfort. Um, the other thing is, is that if you're if someone is choosing to prior prioritize fats over carbohydrates and they're eating fattier cuts of meat, um, they may have problems with fat maldigestion where they tend to burp things up or fatty meals a couple of hours after they eat start to repeat on them. Maybe they start to see stools that float when they go to the bathroom. Uh, these are classic and hallmark symptoms of some kind of biliary or gallbladder deficiency. And it might be, you know, I'm not saying necessarily gallstones, but it certainly could be what we call biliary stasis, or there may be some sludge, which is easy to find with something like a diagnostic ultrasound. But the symptoms are pretty classic. So we start, let me just go back and, and review where we are and then on our next discussion, we'll talk about the balance between fats and carbohydrates as your primary fuel source and, and how we decide which to prioritize. So we set our total caloric goals, take your body weight, multiply that by 10 or 12, probably 12 to begin with, and then every two weeks kind of reevaluate to see where you are. If you're losing weight consistently, keep it there. If you're not, take your body weight, multiply it by 11. Do that for a couple of weeks. If you're losing a pound or so per week, keep it there. But if not, go down to 10. But I wouldn't really necessarily go down to 10. I'd be thinking at 10 calories per pound of body weight, if I'm not losing weight, I've got another obstacle. There's another problem that I need to fix. So we set our calorie goals, then we prioritize our protein. How much protein do I need to efficiently make muscle and burn body fat? Well, we're going to consider, let me give you a range, 0.8 to 1.0 grams of protein per pound of body weight. So again, if someone's 200 pounds, let's say it's one, let's say 0.8, just to make it easy. We're talking about 160 grams of protein per body weight or per day, 160 grams of protein per day. If you're eating four times a day, that's 40 grams of protein in each meal. Or if you're including a protein shake, that's 40 grams. So the math is really, really quite simple. You just need to know the science and the rationale behind all of these. So the next time, uh, let's talk about prioritizing either fats or carbohydrates as our primary fuel source before we talk about understanding whether or not inflammation is actually part of the difficult weight loss scenario. Thank you so much for listening to the Inflammation Nation. If you found this episode valuable, please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast. Be the first to know when a new episode drops so that you can stay on top of your game. It also helps others like you find the answers they need. And why not head over to my main website, drnoseworthy.com, that's drnoseworthy.com, to explore my personalized functional medicine coaching programs, submit a question to the podcast, maybe take a quiz, or even reach out to me using the contact form that you can find there. We'll see you next time.